It's hard to stand on shifting sand. It's hard to shine in the shadows of the night. You can't be free if you don't reach for help. And you can't love if you don't love yourself. There is hope when my faith runs out Cause I'm in better hands now It's like the sun is shining when the rain is pouring down It's like my soul is flying though my feet are on the ground So take this heart of mine there It's like my soul is flying though my feet are on the ground It's like the world is silent though I know it isn't true It's like the breath of Jesus is right here in this room So take this heart of mine, there's no Well, we're in a new series called Without a Doubt. And the first weekend out, we talked about without a doubt, I am. And we understood what it means to be in Christ, to be forgiven, to be accepted. I am accepted. And then we talked about without a doubt, I can. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Never doubt that. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. This weekend, we're taking the next step. We're talking about the fact that without a doubt, I will. I will, and we're talking to you about the dynamics of determination, determination. The Apostle Paul was highly effective because he understood the value of determination. People who will not determine will not do. If you do not determine, you will never do. The determining of a thing uh, really results in the doing of a thing. Anything you've ever accomplished or achieved in your life, it's because at some point in life, you determined to do it. Think about it this way. Everything we set out to do begins with a decision. We engage our mind. Our mind is so important as we're going to see in a moment. And the Apostle Paul made some decisions. You're here this morning because you thought yourself here. You're wearing what you're wearing this morning because you, th you thought yourself, I'm gonna wear that, I'm gonna put that on. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on vacation in terms of making decisions about what you wear. If you've ever been to the beach and noticed what people kind of decide to wear, uh, I, I, I observed something one time and I thought, you know, I felt kind of sorry for this guy. I thought, you know, poor man, he doesn't have a mirror or a friend. 
<laughs> no one to help a brother. But the reality of it is we are wearing what we're wearing because we thought that through. Um, everything we see, everything we have, we have and we see it because someone thought about that. The chair you're sitting in, someone, first of all, envisioned it. They thought about it. They designed it. They built it. So everything we have and everything we do begins with a thought, begins with a thought. Um, that's why it's so important that you get your mind right, that you focus your decisions and you decide to do certain things in life. Everything begins there. And then it doesn't end there because after there is a uh, decision, there must then be a direction, a direction. You have to go somewhere. You have to channel that in a certain uh, way. Uh, you have to make decisions, and those decisions determine direction. And let me ask you this morning, where will you be when you get where you're going? You're going somewhere. What decisions are you making? What direction are you, are you taking? I heard about a guy who said his mother started walking five miles a day when she was 65. He says she's been doing that walking five miles a day since she was 65. He says she's 75 now. We have no earthly idea where she is. <laughs> you get that on the way home. Here's the point. The point is our decision leads to a certain direction. And all of that in, is encompassed with what I'm gonna talk to you about, and that is it ultimately ends up with a term, determination. In other words, I say, this is what I believe God wants me to do. In order to do this, I'm gonna have to channel my life in a certain way to be effective, and then ultimately, if I achieve anything, it's because I was determined to achieve it. The Apostle Paul said this on one occasion. He said, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. What did he mean by that? He meant that I have the freedom to do a lot of things, but I have to determine what is the best thing. I've shared this with you before, but there's a principle. The biggest challenge for most people is not the challenge between that which is good or that which is evil. Most of us understand good and evil. In fact, if you go over and met kids and you talk to the little ones, most of those kids over there, they know the difference between that which is good and that which is evil, you really don't need a lot of discernment on that one. That's kind of a no-brainer. Here's where we need help. We need help discerning what is good for me as opposed to what is best for me. Who is good for you as opposed to who is the best for you? That's where you need discernment. And Paul said, all things are lawful. In other words, I can choose a lot of things, but not everything is going to be ex expedient. It's not gonna be expeditious. It's not going to take me where I need to go. That's why you have to learn how to say no to certain things. You know, you have to learn how to say no to certain people. There's a principle that we talk about here, and it's so true, and that is you will either live your life according to priority, or you'll live your life according to pressure. You will live your life according to the priorities that you set, or you'll live your life according to the pressures that other people bring. Somebody's gonna run your life. <laughs> if you don't, they will. And that's why it's so important that you decide direction and determine to follow it, learn what to say yes to, learn what to say no to, learn to say yes to, learn to who to say no to. It is so important because Paul said, if I'm gonna get where I'm trying to go, I have to be expeditious about it. Though I'm free to do a lot of things, I have to focus on the main thing that God would have me to do. So just for a little while, I wanna talk about that. There is a value, there is a value when you have good decisions followed by great direction and and followed through with great determination. You get this in your life, this quality called momentum. Momentum is a wonderful quality. It's great to have it in business, momentum. Somebody says, I feel like I'm, I've gotten it finally on a roll. It's great to have momentum in a church. And before you get momentum, you, you have to get movement. But once you get movement, uh, that movement, if it progressive and if you stay at it, will create momentum. Uh, movement is a 300 pound man running. Momentum is a 300 pound man running downhill. <laughs> There's a difference. And I wanna see your life and I pray that my life will have momentum. We, we wanna be moving in a direction with great momentum and the way you achieve that momentum is good decisions, great direction, followed by determination. Now this is exactly what the Apostle Paul was writing about in Philippians 3. And just for the few moments that we're together this morning, I wanna talk about the dynamics of determination, and I wanna give you three things to hang our thoughts on. Number one, I want you to think about what we're gonna call insight, insight. Notice what the Paul, Apostle Paul wrote. He said, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. Now, Paul was insightful in the sense that he understood where he was. 
He understood where God had brought him and he understood where he was. The point was, Paul recognized, though he was effective and though he was successful, Paul recognized the fact he was still a work in progress. God wasn't finished with him. And there is a lot of humility connected with that statement. I haven't already attained, nor am I already perfected. Paul said, I know there's room to grow. I know there is space in my life to to stretch, to learn more, to be able to achieve more, to be able to do more. And what I have found with really successful and very effective people, there is always a quality of humility. There is always a quality of humility associated with very successful and effective people. Now that's not true every time. I've met some extremely arrogant people that were very effective at other things. Have you ever met someone and you had this image of who they were until you met them? (laughs) <laughs> and then once you met them, you kind of wish you'd never met them because your image of them was so much better than the reality of actually meeting them. In my profession, I have met other pastors that I had held in esteem, and, and I went to shake their hand and talk to them, and while I'm talking to them, they're looking around me to look at who they really wanted to be talking to <laughs> and not me. And it just kind of shatters your, your ego a little bit, and it tells something more about them than it does you, And the point is, uh, there's an arrogance oftentimes that is associated with successful people, but I've found in my life, the majority of effective and the majority of the successful people that I've met have a great quality of humility. Uh, Real leaders are learners. If you are a leader, you should be a learner because we're constantly moving from one step to the next step. Uh, In fact, in the 37th Psalm, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Life is a series of steps. And we've talked about this before, but where you master life at one step, you're not mastering at the next step. You may be a teacher at one step, but you're a student at the next step. Now, I may know a lot about what I do, but I know very little about what you do. So where I could be a teacher in the things that I know and the things that I do, I would, if I came into your world, I'd be a student. And so life is a series of steps. And as we go from one level to the next level, not only do we discover new devils at new levels, but we discover as we go to these next levels in life that we become students. We're learning things all over again. What's my point? My point is there's never a place to become arrogant or full of ourselves. I mean, Paul was so insightful, and I'm just suggesting to you that this was one of the secrets of his effectiveness, is he had an open mind, he was willing to learn, he recognized the fact, I haven't attained, nor am I perfected. Now, that's not an expression that indicates some kind of state of sinless perfection. He's talking about maturity. He said, I haven't reached a place of complete maturity. Um, And by the way, you, you really never wanna get there anyway. Because the only time you will truly, completely be made perfect is when you're in the presence of God. So it's a good thing that we're, we're still learning. Would you agree? Because the only time you're going to be perfected, the only time you're going to attain is when we finally step into his presence. Third John says, beloved, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're not going to completely be like him. We're going to be imperfect until one day our eyes see him. And we're in the very presence of the Lord. So what's my point? My point this morning is one of the things about Paul that made him so effective was he was insightful. He was honest with himself. Have you ever been trying to find, have you ever tried to find someone's house and maybe, um, you know, you either didn't engage the GPS, maybe you didn't have the right street number, house number, whatever. So you call them on the phone. You have this happen to you. Hey, um, I'm trying to find your house and I am lost. What's the first question they ask you invariably? What do they ask you? Where are you? Right. Uh, Because they can't get you to where you need to be if they don't know where you are. Did you know that's a principle of life? (laughs) That's why you have to be insightful. You'll never get where you need to go if you don't know where you are. So many people I talk to don't know where they are. They're clueless about where they are. They don't know where they are spiritually. They don't know where they are relationally. They don't know where they are economically. They don't know where they are career-wise. They just don't know where they are. Paul was so insightful that he said, here's where I am. Paul said, I'm not perfect. I haven't learned everything I need to learn, but here's what I've determined to do. I'm gonna press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Now, what's that phrase mean? Paul said, I am trying to understand what God saw in me. I'm trying to realize the purpose that God has for me. 
I'm trying to capture everything God has for my life. I don't want to settle for the second best. I don't want to end up on a level below God's best for my life. So I'm pressing on to see God's very best for my life. And as I do it, I'm honest with where I am. I'm honest with who I am. So it begins with insight. You have that one? Let me give you the second thought. It goes into the next verse, hindsight. Hindsight. And this expression is, goes, hindsight is 2020. <laughs> uh, hindsight. Notice what he said. I do not count myself to apprehend it. Now that's, he's tagging what he just said in the previous verse. But he goes on to say, and this is the phrase I want you to catch. This one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are ahead. Now, now get this expression, I am focused. This one thing I do, I, I'm, I'm a man on a mission, I'm focused. You, you see, the reason a life has power is because a life can be channeled. Um, Paul's life was like a river that had power. It wasn't a stagnant swamp. You, you know the difference between a stagnant swamp and a mighty river is the channel, the channel. In Philippians 1.9, Paul said, I'm channeling my thoughts through knowledge and discernment. Think, think about the channel of your life. On one bank, there's knowledge, the things that we learn. And on the other bank, there's discernment. That's wisdom. So knowledge is something that I acquire. Read a book, talk to a friend, learn, stretch, grow. We're all, we're all learning, right? So knowledge is something that we get on our own. Discernment is something that comes from God. The Bible says in James, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives it generally. He doesn't withhold it from any. Wisdom is common sense. I know people who have more degrees than a thermometer and they have no common sense. <laughs> they just have no, no common sense. There's something to be said about horse sense, just common sense. Knowing when to get out of the rain here, appropriate today, right? <laughs> I mean, there's just common sense. Paul said, look, my life is channeled between knowledge and discernment, and it allows me to be focused. It allows me to be a force to be reckoned with. So you have this focusing of Paul, and in this, in this focus, notice what he says, I have learned to forget those things which are behind. One of the greatest attributes of the apostle Paul was his ability to let some things go. And can I tell you one of the, the greatest values in life, one of the, the, the most liberating things that you could ever do for yourself in life is to learn to let some things go. And most of the time we hold things because we want to resolve things. We want to figure them out. It's like life gives you a box of puzzle pieces, right? And you're trying to put all these pieces together and you spend all your life trying to put, maybe you got the box of puzzle pieces when you were a teenager or a child at home. Maybe you came through a rough situation growing up and you spent all your life trying to put that old puzzle together. And some of the pieces are missing and some of the pieces just don't seem to go together. So, and so you're so preoccupied with those old pieces of the puzzle that you can't seem to put together that it's keeping you from seeing the things God has ahead of you. You know what I've learned in life? I've learned and I honestly believe there are some pieces of the puzzle that won't fit until we're in heaven. I think there are some things we're trying to make sense of that will not be sensible until we're in the presence of God. I don't have his mind, nor do you. I won't have his per perfect mind until I'm in his presence. And as I've told you before, I, I think the first expression most of us are gonna have when we get to heaven, you know what it's gonna be? It's gonna be, Oh, <laughs> okay, all right, okay. Because my mind will be like his mind. But until then, guys, God's given us a box of puzzles uh, and the pieces don't always fit. And sometimes, 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 you've gotta to learn to let some things go. You gotta say, I've worked hard, I can't fix this, I've tried to fix this, it can't be fixed, I can't fix it. It's beyond my ability, it's beyond my scope. So, I'm gonna let it go. Sometimes you have to let things go. Hey, get this. Sometimes you have to let people go. In 1 John chapter 2, the Bible says they went out from us because they were not of us, because had they been of us, they would have continued with us. Listen, if somebody can walk out of your life, let them go. If somebody can leave you, it's because they weren't supposed to stay with you. And conversely, when someone stays with you, it's because they couldn't leave you. <laughs> 
In my career, I've chased down and rent, and I have tried to talk people out of and into things. And I have learned that I'm not the Holy Spirit. (laughs) I've had to resign from control of the universe, which is real hard for me. I have to wake up every morning and say, God, you're in control. I'm not. And it's a liberating thing. Have you ever done that? Have you ever just let God be God? Have you? I, I, I highly recommend it. You ought to give that a whirl sometime. But here's the point. The point is, guys, sometimes you hold on to people that God's trying to send away. There are people God will send into your life who are a lot like scaffolding. They're like scaffolding. They'll help you get from one level to the next, but that was their purpose. He'll send them away, and they're going to be scaffolding to someone else. They're going to help someone else get from one level to the next. And I'm just saying, I'm saying that Paul had this great ability. He had hindsight. He had this ability to know what to let go of, who to let go of, so it didn't affect where he's going. You cannot get where you're going if you're dragging some things from your past. Uh, Example, you can't get where you're going if you can't let go of your past mistakes, your past sins, your past failures. I know so many people, you you know what happened to you if you get preoccupied with your rear view mirror when you roll out of the parking lot? You will run right over somebody or into someone. It's valuable, it's good every now and then look in the past so you can remember not to repeat the mistakes again, but glance at it and go on. You, you can't live there, don't get preoccupied there, and I'm just suggesting you that one of the greatest, most liberating things you can do for you is to learn to let go of some people and let go of some circumstances. By the way, the term forgive, you know what one of the meanings of the term forgive really is? You know what it is? Release, release. I could lift my Bible and hold this for a while and do it effortlessly, effortlessly. I I could hold it for a great period of time. Now, if I carry this around all day long with me into the night and I'm just holding this Bible, before long, my arm is gonna ache, my shoulder's gonna ache, before long, my body will ache. It's not the weight, it's the length of time that I'm holding it. Can I tell you, some people are holding some things that really aren't that heavy, but they've been holding them for so long that it's become a major problem in their life. And they just say, man, I just can't let go of it. Well, the word really is not can't, it's won't. (laughs) And the reason most people hold on to something is they're afraid if they let it go, it won't get resolved. If they let it go, it won't be reconciled. I've got to hold it or it won't get fixed. I've got to hold this or it won't get reconciled. If I let this go, it'll never get fixed. Well, let me ask you a Dr. Phil question. How's that working for you? (laughs) How's that working for you? You see, I'm just as miserable as I can. I've held this so long, I'm now, I'm bitter. Oh, it sounds like that's working great for you right there. What am I saying? I'm saying you have to turn some things over to God. You have to say, I'm gonna let go of this. It doesn't mean you don't love a person. It doesn't mean you don't pray for a person. In fact, when you let things go, you probably pray for them more than when you're holding them. But when you let someone go, you're just saying, God, I'm intensifying my prayer for this person and for this circumstance. I recognize I can't fix them, but you can. There was um, a guy that did Paul wrong. In fact, there's an expression, and here's the verse. Let me give it to you. He said, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Now, I love the way the King James words this. He said, the Lord reward him according to what he has done. Now, in our vernacular today, he he was saying, Alex Smith, I hope there's not an Alex Smith here. If so, it's just coincidental. (laughs) He was saying, Alex Smith, Alexander the coppersmith, Alex Smith, he said, he did me wrong. Now, we know he did, or the Holy Spirit wouldn't allow him to put that in the Scripture because the Bible doesn't lie. So we know Alexander the coppersmith did Paul wrong. Paul said he did. And then here, here was the release. Paul said, the Lord reward him according to what he has done. <laughs> Here's a sweet prayer to pray. God, give him everything that's coming to him. Isn't that a sweet prayer to pray? When you're having trouble letting go of someone, just say, Lord, would you please give them everything that's coming to them? Heard about a guy that hated his uncle so bad. He just hated him. He said, if my uncle ever died, I'd never go to his funeral. And then he became a Christian. And his story changed a little. He said, you know, now that I'm a Christian, I'd love to go to my uncle's funeral. <laughs> yeah. 
Think, think about that one. The point is you have to learn to let some people go. You have to let some things go. Hindsight. Here's the third one and we're done. It also involves, look at the next verse, foresight. Foresight. He's saying, I'm pressing. I'm pressing toward the goal. The goal is for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Did you know that call is on every life in this room? God has a destiny for you. He has a plan for your life. He has something that, that for you to do that not another single solitary person on the earth can do it exactly the way you do it. He has a plan for you. And I love the way the Apostle Paul, he puts this. He said, I press, I press. In the Greek, it, it's a term, it means to pursue. Uh, if you're a hunter, uh, it means to go after something like a hunter would go after game. If you're a fisherman, <laughs> it says to go after fish uh, with intensity. I mean, they'll check their tackle, they'll check their bait, they'll check, make sure everything, they need everything. A hunter will make sure he's got his camos and his, his equipment is working properly. It's it being intentional, it's being focused, it's being, uh, 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 you know, going at pursuing. Here's another analogy. If you're not a hunter or a fisherman, uh, it, it's like a boy going after a girl. I don't know how many of you raised sons, but we had that opportunity at our house. And it's something that happens to a little boy when he gets to a certain age, all of a sudden he discovers girls and he realizes they don't have cooties or anything else. And, and here's what starts happening to him. See if this happened to your boy. Um, they start bathing without you having to track them down and hose them down. They, they just, they go, they bathe. It's amazing. They're in there, sometimes more than once they'll bathe. And then they put on deodorant. Oh, glorious, happy day in the house, the day the boy puts on deodorant. But they'll start putting on deodorant. And then it isn't long until you smell them before they get into the room. It's, oh, you got into dad's high karate or whatever, you know? I mean, they just clone, they just clone. And you start connecting dots. He's bathing, he's deodorizing, he's putting on cologne. He cares what he looks like. <laughs> his shoes match, he changed his underwear. This is a great day. Everything is happening the way we hoped that it would happen. And all of a sudden you realize, this is what happened to my boy. My boy discovered a girl, oh and he is pursuing this girl, and everything about him has changed because of the pursuit. Now, that's a lot to get out of those words, but that's, <laughs> that's basically what it means. It means to go after something with intensity to the point that it changes you. You wear the camo, you put on the deodorant, you put on the cloth. In other words, everything about my life is getting directed in this pursuit. I, I'm seeing where God has me. To, I want, I, I'm focused on where he wants me to go. And let me tell you, the older you get, the more focused you should become. Because the older you get, you realize, you know, I'd I, I like to think of myself at, at midlife. I said I'd like to think of myself, but I don't know too many 114-year-old guys out there. You know what I'm saying? So I've come to terms with the fact that I'm somewhere in the third quarter, deep into the third quarter. <laughs> I'm okay with that, I really am, I, I'm okay with that, but I've come to terms with the reality, I probably have more game behind me than I have in front of me. And, and because I'm somewhere in the third quarter, I have to be careful how I use my time, I have to be careful how I use my friendships, I have to be careful how I use uh, the giftings God has given me, my, my family time. In other words, I have to be more focused because I have less time. The, the, the greatest asset you have is your time. You can make more money, you can't get more time. So it's so important as you, as you move into this foresight of sensing where God would have you to go, that you learn, don't, you, 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 you try to minister to people and help people, but, uh, you, but also, <laughs> you, ha you can't waste time with people who waste your time. Now, there are people you'll have the opportunity to minister. As I've used this before, there are people who are, who are replenishing friends. Do you have any like that in your life? There are people in, in our life, and Cindy and I, particularly at this phase of life, have come to appreciate that even more. There are people that, that are replenishing. You, you, you know how you tell a replenishing friend? It's when you're in their presence and time flies. You, 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 you know, you go to dinner, you hang out at the house, all of a sudden you're going, wow, it's just, where'd the time go? 
and you get in the car and you're just reflect, refreshed from being with them. It's, we gotta do that more often. This is crazy. We need to get together. Life's too young, but you know, all that thing. Because the friendship is replenishing. You, you love each other's company. You need those kinds of people in your life because <laughs> you're going to have draining relationships. Do you have any of those? That's where you look at your watch and say, oh, we've been here 15 minutes. Oh. That's where you walk to the dinner table and you crawl back to the car. Do you have anybody in your life that just sucks the life right out of you? I mean, you just feel this, you're like, I'm melting. You know, just in their presence, it's going away. And you get back in the car after you spend a little time with a person like that, they just worn you out and you just look at your spouse and you go, never, ever do this again. We can't do this anymore. You know, you're gonna have people like that. So to balance it, be sure you've got some replenishing friendships in your life because the draining ones are gonna be there too. And you gotta learn how to, you know, you gotta learn how to discern between the two. Because I'm saying we have fewer ahead of us than we have behind us and Paul was focused on where he was trying to go. And in these three verses, I believe we catch the sense of his determination. Insight, hindsight, foresight. Let's pray. As I lead you in prayer this morning, I'm mindful of the fact that everybody in the room has a different burden, a different challenge, a different issue that you're struggling with this morning. But I'm also aware of the fact that God knows who you are. He knows what you're dealing with and there's nothing he cannot handle. And I would challenge you this morning as I close this service to be willing to say, God, with all that I am and all that I have, I give this to you. I can't carry this burden. I can't handle this issue. I, I gotta let this thing go. I gotta let this go. It may be someone you're trying to forgive. It may be something you're trying to forget. And by the way, you, you can never truly forget anything. What happens is God by his spirit in time can take the pain out of the memory. So in the sense of forgetting, I'm not saying that you just act like it never happened, that I am saying that God can take the pain out of the memory. And maybe your prayer this morning would be, God, help me to release this. Help, help take the pain out of the memory of that bad situation. I need to release it, and I need to release them. God has so much ahead of you. He has so much in front of you that he wants to do through you. Don't allow the pain of your past to keep you from experiencing God's best in your future. And then I would say just again before I pray, there may be some in this room who've never trusted Christ as your Savior. What an amazing morning on this rainy Sunday morning to be able just to give your entire heart and soul, just to turn it all over to God. Just to say, Lord, in this room at this moment, I receive you as my Savior. Come into my life and forgive my sin. A simple prayer like that Believing in your heart can make all the difference in your life. And for others of you, if you just need to spend some time in prayer, we're going to have some folks down here at the front. Don't be in too big of a hurry to leave. Allow someone here at the front just to pray with you, to pray for you before you leave today. Now let's close in prayer. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you never fail. Thank you, Lord, that you're able to do the impossible. And I pray for my friends this morning. You will lift the burdens that they carry, that you'll bless their lives, protect them. For those that don't know you, give them the courage to trust you. And Lord, help us this week to be cognizant of the fact that you have a purpose for our life. And we'll give you praise, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. God